Ladies and gentlemen, my dear new champions, hello and welcome. It's my pleasure as the head of the new champions community of the World Economic Forum to welcome you to this plenary and to introduce our moderators for this session, Vikram Chanda and Linda Wei. Welcome. Hello everyone and welcome to this special keynote session as we, we celebrate and are inspired by this absolutely fantastic community that we have gathered here today, the new champions. Linda, the new champions? Uh, well, Vikram, first of all, uh, welcome everyone. Um, I'm delighted to say the new champions that we are uh, highlighting today are the pioneers the inventors, the next generation leaders, and the fast growing companies that are creating value through innovation. They include, the new champions, young global leaders. They've achieved their success young, under the age of 40, and have shown a commitment to make a positive impact on society. A second group of new champions are the global shapers. They're exceptional young individuals under the age of 30, located in over 330 cities around the world. And another group are the young scientists. They're outstanding researchers under the age of 40 who are pioneering new fields and leading in the pursuit of global impact and the common good. And rounding off the community, there are three other communities to go. There are the global growth companies, the most dynamic high growth companies. Each of them actually has the potential to become a leader then in the, in the global economy. We have the Schwab Foundation Social Entrepreneurs. These are both for-profit and not-for-profit organizations and enterprises which are having a positive and a tangible impact on low-income or underserved populations. And finally, there are the technology pioneers which are innovative entrepreneurial companies which develop and apply technological innovations to positively transform both business and society. What they have in common is that each community has committed to making a positive impact on society. And we're going to be hearing today about their discoveries. And also, we're going to try and assess and learn today how the innovations that they're bringing to the fore are helping us to tackle some of the big global challenges of the day. And we also want to hear from you. Those of you in the audience and at home can join the conversation with us on social media using the hashtag newchampions or by emailing newchampions, that's one word, at wef. Dot ch. The question that we want you to start thinking about for later is, which are the global challenges that you think are most in need of innovative solutions? So post your answers, have a think about it, get online with us, and help us shape this discussion. All right, so essentially that's what we're going to be doing, looking at it from two aspects. The big global challenges that need innovative solutions and some of the work that is being done on innovations in any case to help further human progress. So both of them, we're going to look at both aspects of it and then try and put it together. So let me start off by welcoming the first three special guests we have with us. I'd like to invite onto the stage Stefan Bansel from of Moderna Therapeutics. It's, uh, Stefan, come on up onto the stage. It's great to have you with us. We have Ivana Galyansky, who's assistant professor at the Belgrade Metropolitan University. Uh, Ivana. Uh, Please, please come along here as well. And we have Yobi Benjamin, who's from Avagan. Please come. So each of them has done absolutely fantastic work, and we're going to be... Um, why don't you come there? No, I'll, I'll grab this. So each of them has done great work, and we're going to hear a little bit about the work that they've done, and then later just play for you a small video of what the community itself has been able to achieve they, in a sense, are the flag bearers of their community. So I'm going to get you, Stefan, to kick off uh, Moderna Therapeutics and some of the really fascinating work that you're doing in modern medicine, genetics, call it what you will. Okay. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Yeah. yeah. Uh, good morning, everybody. So Moderna is a Boston-based biotech company. We are developing a totally new way to uh, deliver protein medicines to patients. And what we are doing is we're basically uh, having the patient make their own drug. Uh, and what we have done is we have developed a set of technologies. Basically, we have nine technologies that we've combined together 
to be able to send uh, an information to the patient cell where the cell make their own protein using messenger RNA. So if you think about the dogma of biology, you know, we have DNA in every one of our cells that makes a RNA, that makes a protein. The entire biotech industry over the last 40 years has done wonderful things for patients, but I think they went at it the very hard way, which is making protein. It is really hard to make protein. And when you think about it in factories, they make protein in bacteria or in CHO cell. Uh, whereas when we in inject the messenger RNA to a patient, they make their own. It's man-made medicines. And so uh, we think there are three very uh, disruptive impact of this technology. One is we can not only do drugs that the biotech industry can do, but we can make uh, drugs after targets that you cannot make drugs against. So the ability to make new drugs for patients. Two is speed. Uh, rather than taking quarters to develop a new drug, we can do a drug in just a matter of weeks. And because of that speed element in discovery, we can reduce the cost of developing drugs because it takes, to the normal process of making drugs, it takes years before you start clinical trial. So here we can go in the clinic very quickly. And also, uh, the icing on the cake is the technology is much cheaper, around 90%, 90 cheaper than recombinant. So that will have huge impact as we have an aging population, emerging markets. So the company has grown from nothing three years ago to now uh, 200 people, 42 preclinical drugs uh, are in testing right now. Uh, so very high growth. And so the global growth company has been a great community for us to share experiences with companies that are a few years ahead of us, that have scaled up, that have grown. And so we talk about how do you hire people? How do you train people? How do you manage the complexity of the fact that you have those people joining the company, which is like a big Shinkansen going very fast? And how do you get them on board? So, Stefan, this is an example of uh, discovery and innovations that you've been pursuing uh, and your company is pursuing for the sake of innovation for advancing human progress. And yet it is something that has the potential to totally change uh, and to have a major impact on a big global challenge as well, which is the challenge of how do you get healthcare to everyone? How do you get pharmaceuticals to everyone? Yes, and, and, and that's why we, we like this approach very much because uh, cost is a big issue in healthcare. And by developing drug faster, you're going to reduce the cost because that's one of the big components of, of, of the final cost that is charged to a patient. So we believe this can have a big impact. And the other thing that is very exciting is we have the ability to do drugs that are very transformational. One drug that has been published in Nature that we developed is a drug that you use after uh, somebody has a heart attack. And it's a one-dose drug, one dose. You need to give it between uh, 48 hours plus the heart attack. But what it does is the drug that we inject basically tells the stem cell on the heart of a patient, hey guys, go back to work and rebuild the heart tissue. Because if not, patients end up dying from heart failure because the heart cannot pump any more of the blood. All right, that's, that's absolutely a fascinating story, and that's exactly the sort of a story that I think inspires all of us and the sort of uh, story that we're looking to build on. And that's exactly why you are a global growth company, and this is what the entire community has been doing. Gurley, 1991. The Greek company was founded in 1991. Our annual production was only 20,000 units. After 22 years, our annual capacity has amounted to 60 million units. For 20 years in a row, we have been ranking on the list of top um, 500 in, by the Fortune magazine and the top 100 Chinese companies. Our spirit is to exceed ourselves. Our innovation lies in our concentration and commitment to our development and technological innovation, and our commitments to cultivate an entrepreneurship spirit that belongs exclusively to China. Precisely because of this entrepreneurship that has enabled the World Economic Forum to become a pioneer and to facilitate industrial development, to create job opportunities, and to become the pioneer in the world industries. Thank you are gathered out here. It's, it's a great community doing wonderful work. And let's, let's move on now to the young scientists represented here by Ivana Gadiansky. Ivana, talk to us about some of the innovations and some of the things that you're doing. 
Hi, Vikram, thank you. Um, I'm a stem cell biologist. I work on tissue engineering and 3D bioprinting on methods how to make it more efficient. And um, what is interesting is that I did my PhD in neuroscience and uh, I'm able to use the techniques that I was using then, now a little bit adapted, but also on stem cells. So I think this is a very good example of uh, what I would like to also call innovation. Um, using, so going from one field to another. So basically this is what the scientists are doing now. We are reinventing ourselves because uh, it's not enough to be now good only in one field. You have to be a multi-expert. And uh, you, you can see that uh, the lines, the boundaries between fields within STEM, STEM uh, science, technology, engineering, math, are blurring and uh, we are having now really uh, one amalgam of all the disciplines and not only these between themselves but also arts and I'm also a poet so for me that also gives another perspective science and arts and uh, of course science and entrepreneurship are also merging and uh, they go naturally together science and entrepreneurship are both uh, disruptive and innovative so they really do go naturally together and I have founded myself a startup and uh, within the group of young scientists uh, there are many who have startups who work in the industry also and this this merge of science and entrepreneurship is also innovative and it helps uh, getting the basic research results into the real life uh, implementation applications and um, I would really like to, to point out that uh, the group of young scientists, uh, the, the innovations that we all bring, uh, they are very multidisciplinary. So it's really like uh, having a renaissance-like uh, uh, mindset now to be a scientist. Because if you want to work on cancer, on vaccines for Ebola, which is now being made as we speak, and uh, hopefully, and uh, cosmic magnetic field or uh, superconductors or uh, wearable electronics, which is what uh, this batch of young scientists is working on, you really, really have to, to think uh, about the wide uh, angle, so the, the big picture to have in mind. So I would really, really say that that is an innovation in itself, so science reinventing itself. So. We I mean, when you, when you got into this field, when you're, you're professors, when you got into this field, was it the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake? Or did you at some point feel at the back of your head that if we can pull this off, it can transform, it can transform the world? Yes, well, when I started my PhD in neuroscience, uh, I was uh, very curious. I wanted to find out how the brain works. But uh, then at some point I thought, but wait a minute, okay, I. I will do this for my curiosity, but I also want to help people. I want, then I actually worked on neurodegenerative disease, I worked on multiple sclerosis, and I was really thinking how this, what I'm doing, can help people. So that is the ultimate goal, to help the people. All right, so that, that's, that's fantastic. And that's what many of the young scientists do. They start off by pursuing knowledge for its own sake, but then somewhere along the way, many of them find that what the innovations that they are actually coming up with do help to transform the world itself. This is some of the work that's being done by the young scientist community. The World Economic Forum for Young Scientists attracts around science and innovation a number of young leaders and some elder mentors. In today's world, where high technology and sophisticated and somewhat complex science are ubiquitous, the link may be hard to see and how the second generates the first surely impossible to predict. Leaders who want a better view of what breaking technologies can create as opportunities can't miss to have a better understanding of what's happening in today's labs developing fundamental science. Making this connection has for me a tremendous value that young scientists bring to the communities assembled by the World Economic Forum of New Champions. All right, so put your hands together for the young scientists, all of them gathered here in this room. And, and let's move on now to the technology pioneers. And this is one of the areas where absolutely stunning work is being done. You've heard about Google Glass and the like. Well, Yobi, Yobi here can beam, beam stuff directly onto your retina, right, Yobi? Hi, my name is uh, Yobi Benjamin, and I'm co-founder of a company called Avigant. We produce the Glyph. And the Glyph is a virtual retinal display device. Basically, 
we do not have a screen, uh, and we project images directly to your retina. We started our journey as a uh, building a product for our U.S. Special Forces that had low light, was a low light product and low heat product, and it's used for targeting systems. But we realized that we had a much bigger vision, and the bigger vision was to create a general purpose consumer product that's a wearable, that's a fashion-forward device that you would not be shy to wear in the street, and for a price point that everybody can afford. I think the important part is of, uh, of what we do is really probably a generation beyond what we do right now. It's our goal to help people who are functionally blind, not the totally blind, by the way, but functionally blind people to someday be able to enjoy the same movies that you do enjoy today and for you to be able to play the games that you enjoy today. Um, it's probably a generation away, but that's what we aim to do. Um, finally, I want to thank all the technology pioneers for this class. It's very humbling to be here to represent people who print organs, make clean water, <laughs> and uh, you know, do really complex analytics. I'm very honored. Finally, I'll say I began my life and career. Uh, I was brought up in the Philippines, grew up in the Philippines, and educated in the Philippines. And immigrated to the United States, became an American citizen. But today, I feel that I've really achieved what I really wanted to be, which is to become a citizen of the world and be amongst all of you. Thank you very much. Maybe that's it. That's a fascinating story. Can I just ask you, uh, out of curiosity, beaming directly onto the retina, you're, you're sure it's safe, right? Yes, it's absolutely safe. You know, we use, we actually don't use a very low power LED, which we bounce off two million micromirrors uh, and rebounce that directly to your retina. The other thing I found really fascinating about your story is that you started off with one particular goal. Actually, it was a military goal. So you started off with that goal, but somewhere along the way, you found that this is something that can actually you know, help the visually impaired across the board. You know, that was an accident born about by the vagaries of politics. In the United States, we had last year what's called sequester, which means they couldn't pass a budget and uh, Congress, and because they couldn't pass a budget, they couldn't pay us. So we said, you know what, we gotta use this for something else, and we ended up building a consumer device, and we ended up hoping to be uh, a product that will, will help people who are functionally blind. You know, I've heard the sequester blamed for a lot of things, but perhaps it's not entirely a bad idea. Maybe we could, if that's a sort of a positive impact that can sometimes have as a result of that. But that's part of what the technology pioneers often do. They go off in one direction, and then before you know it, suddenly their products are taking a life of their own and leading to certain utilities which are not immediately obvious at first glance. Here's a look at the technology pioneer community. Hello. Technology is increasingly important to business and society. The purpose of the technology pioneers program of the World Economic Forum is to allow high-impact innovators and disruptors to bring their voices to the forum's discussions. At the annual meeting in Davos this past January, I had the opportunity to meet with the community of technology pioneers. I could say they're an incredibly intellectually curious and passionate group who believes technology can solve some of the great challenges we have in health, energy, uh, governance and poverty, just to name a few. I'd like to welcome the new cohort of technology pioneers to the community and the forum. I look forward to seeing how these companies, together with other leaders across cultures and sectors, will continue to transform industry agendas with their cutting edge technologies and breakthrough ideas. All right, a round of applause for the technology pioneers. And 
And now for the second part of it, looking at some of the big global challenges, let me hand over to Linda. Thanks, Vikram. Um, remember at the beginning of the session, we asked you to have a think about which global ch um, challenges you think are most in need of innovative solutions. So on social media, I have a contribution from Nina Jansen, and she says the biggest global challenge that requires innovative solutions are securing water, food, energy, all within one planet's boundaries. But what do you think? I want you to take a couple of minutes, turn to your neighbor, and have a chat. And I'll come back and share with us what you guys think are the biggest challenges that's in need of an innovative solution. Talk amongst yourselves. This is misbehaving. like to share with all of us what you've come up with with your neighbor. I'm going to, I used to be an academic, so I'm going to do a terrible thing, and I'm going to walk around, and if you don't avoid eye contact, you're probably in the hot seat. And Mark, unfortunately, I know you, so you are now in the hot seat. <laughs> what do you think are the biggest global challenges that need an innovative solution? Come onto the red carpet. It's kind of like winning a prize, but I've got nothing to offer you. <laughs> well, I'll do a shameless plug then, because uh, we address climate change by uh, turning greenhouse gas emissions into plastic. Um, so clearly we need to have climate change solutions. But I think probably the biggest is energy. I mean, if you look at solar, wind, um, you know, we're starving for a breakthrough, I think. And if I wasn't doing what I'm doing today, I think that would be the area that would be the most exciting. Because if, if you had very low-cost power, you could make clean water a whole lot easier. If you had very low-cost power, you could address you know, things like peace a whole lot easier. So I think if there's one area, it's got to be energy. Great. Thank you very much. That's Mark Harima in the hot seat. Who's next? Oh, a volunteer. You've become my favorite person. What do you think is the biggest global challenge that needs an innovative solution? Education innovation is what we badly need. In the age of the uh, internet, traditional pedagogical models no longer work for the new generation, for the next generation. Therefore, education is a field whereby we need innovation the most. And in the globalized uh, world, we uh, do need uh, Eastern cultures like uh, uh, Chinese uh, culture to find its relevance uh, in this new global context uh, with a combination of the East and the West and the Yin and Yang. Education also a big global challenge, bringing together the traditions of the West and the East in need of innovative ways uh, to further that agenda. Thank you very much indeed for that contribution. Um, I'm going to have to sneak one in, but you're going to have to be very quick. Come and join me on the red carpet. Uh, one of the very big challenges in the world today is tuberculosis, a fully curable disease that's become a pandemic with 9 million new cases in the world. And the loss to the world's economy is going to be an unbelievable $3.4 trillion in the next five years if we don't watch out. Millions of children dead, millions orphaned, millions without food, without jobs if we don't watch out now. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, thank you. Um, on social media, um, I have a contribution. One of the grand challenges 
is the empowerment of those at the margins of society. How do we close the inequality gap? And on this question, I'd like to pull in Mark Freeman from Encore, come join me. He is with the Social Entrepreneur Group. So Mark, on this issue, um, what do you think uh, we should be thinking about in terms of, uh, for you, the biggest global challenges? Aging society, you know, what would you most like to uh, have this group focus on? Well, you, you named it, aging societies and demographic change. We're having uh, countries all across the globe, particularly in the developed world, where there's an explosion of older people, and that's a result of a great triumph in longevity, and yet for all the progress we've made, uh, mostly it's portrayed as a disaster. We hear about this long gray wave of greedy geezers who will be bankrupting posterity, and I, at Encore, we believe that hidden in plain sight is an extraordinary opportunity that, that what's seen as uh, an unsolvable problem is an experience dividend. Never before have so many people had so much experience and the time to do something with it. And in the United States, what many people want to do with it is what we've seen Bill Gates do. We just saw a video from him. They want to have a second act that's focused on solving the big problems of the world. Already. Nine million people have moved in that direction and 31 million more want to, want to follow in their footsteps and many of them are spending a decade or, or longer in this work. If you add that up, that's 40 million years of human capital that could be used to solve some of the most vexing challenges in the world today. Thank you very much indeed, Thank Mark. Thank you. Um, let's uh, hear a little bit more about social entrepreneurs. The big issues that we're talking about here at the WEF, issues like food security, poverty alleviation, climate change, unemployment, are simply issues that cannot be handled by any individual alone. It needs partnerships, partnerships with governments, partnerships with NGOs, and partnerships with civil society at large. Social entrepreneurs, more than any, possess the creativity, the ingenuity, and the ability to work in partnership with many of these parties above to address in a creative way many of these social issues. Your role models, not only for other young entrepreneurs, but more importantly, also for businesses like ourselves as well. We, frankly, could not address in our business model many of these societal issues if we don't link in firmly with the creativity and the passion and the strong purpose-driven models that you have created. You're therefore role models for many people beyond what you can imagine yourselves. Great. Uh, please join me in giving a round of applause to the social entrepreneurs. <laughs> um, social media, I'm getting another contribution that says another challenge and need of an innovative solution is boosting entrepreneurship amongst the poor. Uh, let me bring in now Matsi Modis. She is with the South African Entrepreneurs Forum and part of the Global Shapers. New champions. <laughs> and you clearly have a fan club. <laughs> Matsi, share with us your story. Thank you. I'm Matsi Mudisa. I'm the founding curator of the Soweto Hub, and I'm a proud Global Shaper. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Great. So, I'm loving this crowd. <laughs> I'm Matsi. So, you know, in terms of um, some of these challenges we're hearing, boosting entrepreneurship, poverty, inequality, you know, what do you see as a challenge that's a need of an innovative solution on a global scale? Great. So, yes, in South Africa, I run a forum. It's a nonprofit called the South African Black Entrepreneurs Forum. It's about promoting, inspiring, and growing entrepreneurship in underserved communities. Um, they were not previously dispos uh, um, disposed to what is it to actually run a business? Because structurally, they're not taught to be entrepreneurs. Structurally, they're not educated to be doctors and engineers. So they didn't have much to work with. But now, we are a nation. We are consolidated. Um, we are freed. You know, we have great leaders like Nelson Mandela, and we have the opportunities. It's a function of what do we do with those opportunities. So the forum essentially goes into communities, rural areas, and how do we educate people about 
what it is to run a business. How do we grow and expand their mind and expose them to what are the key um, um, industries in our country? And how do you as an individual play your part and contribute towards the mainstream economy? Because that's what's required of you as a, as a citizen of South Africa. Mm, great. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, let's, <laughs> let's hear a little bit more about the Global shape, Shapers. We are a global community partner of the Global Shapers community and we chose to become one and are privileged to have been accepted as one because the future belongs to this community and more importantly to the constituency that this community represents. As a business we are very driven by social engagement and stakeholder engagement into the communities in which we operate. We are very driven by ensuring that the people in the markets that we serve are better served by more empathetic companies. I think the most important aspect that will come out of this partnership is the learning exercise. We'd like to learn more about what the global shapers are thinking about, how they intend to change the world, what is it that the world is going towards. I'm very excited about this partnership and the reason I'm excited is because I think it's the most innovative and exciting thing that the World Economic Forum has done in the last 20 or 30 years. By engaging with people that will be the leaders of tomorrow, by engaging with people that understand what the world of tomorrow is going to look like, we're making a bridge between those that govern today and those that will govern tomorrow. Join me in giving a round of applause to the Global Shapers. On social media, China's urbanization, industry's thirst for energy, and a consumer class boom threatens the world's natural resources. Is it sustainable? Let me bring in now um, another representative of the final community, Peggy Liu. She is with Juice. She's one of the young global leaders. So. <laughs> Clearly, I'm going to have to give the other groups a chance, by the way, to do your uh, cheering uh, again. But, uh, <laughs> but Peggy, um, just uh, tell us a little bit about um, these challenges, sustainability challenges for China, which must absolutely be huge, the world's most populous nation, undergoing a radical transformation. Is it a sustainable transformation? Are you um, trying to not let so me sleep at night? The, <laughs> <laughs> it would actually probably keep most of us up at night, but, but I'm sure you've got some suggestions and innovative solutions. <laughs> you know, we just completed the 10th annual YGL Summit um, on the Great Wall, and one of the historians that we invited to speak about the last 5,000 years of Chinese civilization and its impact on the future talked about how economic problems won't be an issue for China. Political problems won't be an issue for China. The greatest challenge we'll face is economic, or sorry, environmental disasters. I run a nonprofit called JUICE, uh, called Joint US-China Collaboration on Clean Energy. And I've been working in this field for eight years to try and green China. We're trying to fundamentally transform the way that we create and use energy. And in these few years, we've been able to introduce the concept of smart grid into China to revolutionize the power grid. We've been able to train 800 mayors and central government bureau heads across China on how to build sustainable cities and so forth. China's problems is not that it doesn't want to go green. It's completely committed to go green. Our problem is, is that we don't have access to solutions that can scale at gigascale, gigapace in Chinese context. And so my job in part has been to try and access international experts around the world to come and help us in China. And this, the World Economic Forum, has been the best platform for me around the world to access people in different sectors across borders who are willing to do this with juice on the ground. One of the lessons that I've learned in my five years as a young global leader is that collaborative leadership is a very difficult but necessary skill to learn. And sustainability is essentially a nexus issue, right? And so one of the greatest challenges that keeps me up at night is how do we bring people together, for example, nutritionalists and sustainable agriculturalists and storytellers 
to teach kids how to eat in a way that's good for you and good for the planet? How can we engage young kids in climate change through their stomachs? And this is not something one particular sector of experts can do. The last thing that I've learned being a young global leader is, is that we need to reach out to people and not just talk about thought leadership in jargon. We are talking about massive behavior change. Young global leaders are changing society on the ground. And to do this, we need to learn how to be human as leaders. We need to talk to people's hearts and not just to people's heads. So in 2010, we, Juice has launched a program called China Dream, Zongguomong, in order to talk to people about sustainability, not through jargon like low carbon mobility or eco cities, but about prosperity about what it's like to have livable communities, or safe food and air and water, and vibrant living. These are all the same purposes, or aligning people in the same way. So thanks to the Young Global Leaders, thanks to David Aikman especially. Thank you very much, Peggy, thank you. I love that. Um, let's hear a little bit more about the Young Global Leaders. The YGLs are a community of young leaders who are committed to something other than just making more money. They're committed to making a substantial difference on the planet during their lives. And we work together to make that happen. Everyone is sort of special and has been told that over and over again. So the challenge is actually not to talk about yourself, but to be interested in what other people are doing. To be interested rather than trying to be interesting. And to sit down to next to somebody who you haven't met before, whose bio looks totally different than yours, and just have a conversation and to see what comes. For me, I took a, a learning journey with the YGLs to the slums of Dharavi, Mumbai, and was so inspired by what women were doing in the slums to form uh, saving circles that it changed the work that I was doing. And I left my job and started a new company called Yertle. And something crazy like that could only come out of a, a community like this, a community where we all believe that uh, we can pitch in and we can help each other. And even if the idea is crazy, maybe we can make it happen. A round of applause, please, for the young global leaders. Right. Okay. Linda, do you want to? Linda, you want to come and join us up on stage? Yep, I will. And uh, Vikram, I think what's really struck me about listening um, to Matsi, to Mark, and uh, to Peggy is that they've really committed themselves to these grand challenges. Um, in fact, that is their work now, looking for innovative solutions. And I find that extremely inspiring. So hopefully they'll come and join us on the stage Yeah, why don't well. you come up as well, uh, Peggy, Matsi, and Mark. You know, I think, I think what we've just heard over the last 20, 25 minutes is two different aspects of it. We've seen some fantastic work that is being done on innovation, innovation for the sake of advancing human progress, and then we've seen these big challenges which need solving. And I think what we, we should now turn our attention to is to just take a look at any possible gaps that might be getting thrown up between the innovations that are being already done and between the challenges that need solving. Are there any gaps that come to your mind? And let's leave this free-flowing. Any of you? Is there a gap that can come to your mind? Peggy? Yes. Uh, uh, one of the issues that we face in sustainability, especially sustainable urbanization, is taking innovative solutions but deploying them at giga scale in China. You know, uh, other developed nations have gone through what we're going through, but uh, when there's less people in the country and you know, everything was smaller scale. So how can we commercialize your innovative solutions faster? How can we pilot them across 10, 20 cities in a shorter amount of time? We're running out of time. Any of you? Yeah, I think when you think about healthcare, it's a very interesting time that we are living now, is that you have a total exponential explosion of knowledge because you have convergence of technologies, you have you know, the communication, so you can read papers, you can contact people on the internet and so on. So on the one hand, you have this exponential knowledge going on. And on the other hand, I worry about two things. I worry about uh, doctors because most doctors, not the key opinion leaders who do research and do papers, but most doctors, they get paid by how many patients they see. And a lot of them don't do a lot of continuous education. And so how do we make sure you know, the, the clinicians, the doctors, are aware about diseases? Because if you think about 
it's a lot of doctors were trained thinking about symptoms, not about diseases, because we did not understand the mechanistic root cause of a disease for a long time, and we're starting slowly to understand. Some diseases, we understand nothing. Some diseases, we're starting to be pretty good at. And the other one is, is the patients, because a lot of patients understand more about their iPhone or their apps than they understand about how their body works. And, and as you have all this transformation of medicine, I think that we need, as a society, uh, this forum needs to really do something about how do we educate with all the technology available now, the patient and the clinician. Yeah, go ahead. Why don't you jump in and then I want to bring you Max. Uh, my thought on the question that was posed about scale is I think the answer is really in biology and in, in nature itself. It's very hard to scale technology. You can, ma you can make purifiers, you can, you can be build solar systems, you can do all of this, but they are very difficult to scale at the size of China. Biology has a few secrets for us, you know, and I think if there's any gap that requires a lot more, uh, a lot more research is how biology itself and nature itself, how can, how can it be a self-correcting system? I don't know the answer, but I think that's where I would be trying to look for solutions that will really scale. I think Ivana, you wanted to say something? Yes, well, I see one of the biggest challenges is to make these uh, new disruptive innovations available to as many people as possible. So, yes, to scale, to, to make it uh, commercial, but to also make it affordable. Like, uh, for example, stem cell banking, it exists now, and, but you have to pay for it. And there are also some uh, ethical issues, of course, about it. Like, uh, in some countries, it's uh, not allowed to, to have uh, private stem cell banking, for example. It has to be public. So I think all these uh, ethical issues, legal issues, and making it available for many people, these are big challenges. Matsi, why don't you come in on this? Well, just to add on to what Manu said, I think most new innovations tend to be very expensive. And it's a bit of a challenge for us to try to bridge the digital divide. Um, you look at entrepreneurs, most of the entrepreneurs I engage with do not have a digital presence. They don't have websites. Um, nobody would know that there's somebody that's running a very special bed and breakfast in Soweto all the way in Tianjin. Uh, they don't have email addresses. So it's very, very expensive. And also bearing in mind that 70% of people do not have electricity. How do you actually have a digital presence if you don't even have electricity? So the infrastructural component of it is quite key. That bearing in mind that you do have innovations, but then how do we integrate them into these communities we're trying to change? Mark, what are you coming? What is a gap that you, there just is not enough innovation there to try and address? Well, I think it's a gap that could even uh, expand further if all of you brilliant scientists and technologists are successful, which is the gap between the length of lives and the, the shape and purpose of longer lives. Already half the kids born in the developed world since 2000 are projected to live to 100. And we've been much better at figuring out how to extend lives than to what to do with all these years that have been added in many ways to the middle, not to the end. Can I just take off from what Matthew said and just ask, uh, ask both of you perhaps that at the end of the day though, are there a different scale and a different set of challenges that are there in advanced economies or the developed economies and in the, the rest of the world? Uh, is there enough of work being done on both sides of it? I mean, there's lots of innovation, for example, in Silicon Valley and places like that, which are aimed at some of the problems of the US advanced economies. Is there enough of an incentive for people to go out and innovate and find solutions to some of the issues that Matsu, for example, was referring to? I think there's enough. Uh, I think there's enough uh, innovation in Silicon Valley, in fact, and there's also incentive in Silicon Valley. I think uh, there's a lot of companies that have built their systems by building free systems, free software, for example. Um, it used to be have to buy soft operating systems. You don't need to do that today if you really didn't want to. They're freely available. Um, that's just one example of where Silicon Valley can innovate without necessarily having the incentive of capitalism driving it. 
uh, with regards to clean energy and clean water and, you know, and conservation, we have hundreds of companies within probably one square mile in Silicon Valley that are all tackling these problems. I think it's there, but finding its way to China, finding itself, finding the way to you, hopefully we could do it through here, right here at the World Economic Forum. And I know there are companies here that do it today now. Um, I, I think the interesting thing about sustainability is, is that much of it is infrastructure related. So it doesn't scale as easily as uh, mobile app technology, for example. Um, and I, I think the comparison is not necessarily emerging countries and developed nations, but the governance structure. So I talk a lot about uh, across the around the world about how China actually has many advantages in going green because it has a centralized decision making power to uh, uh, make decisions like building the high-speed rail. In 2007, it started building its first high-speed rail. In 2012, it became the largest, world's largest and fastest network. So it can it can do that. It can also it has a central um, uh, targets that are set, but then it pilots at a city level, not a building level, but a city level. So it can actually commercialize technologies, uh, which of course with economies of scale makes them affordable for people around the world. So my message is always come bring your innovative solutions to us, uh, and uh, us meaning China, and work together with us to create economies of scale, then work with us to bring them the solutions out to the rest of the world. Okay. And um, we have uh, another contribution from social media from Noah Gaffney. And she says, how can we pilot innovative solutions faster? And uh, she put on uh, add juice. So Peggy, you're going to have to answer first. <laughs> um, well, again, it's for sustainability, I work in sustainability, so I'm going to focus on that. Uh, a, a lot of these problems, they're at a city level. Again, you can't work at a building level. So luckily, China is building cities at a time. We'll have over 220 cities of a million people or more. So as it builds out these new communities, these new cities, we're reaching out to people in Germany, in um, the US, in Australia, to bring those technical solutions and literally throwing the dice. It's like throwing arrows at a bullseye. All we need is one of those cities to hit the bullseye for us then to roll that solution out across the nation. So the, China is a, it's really a unique, unique place and it really is the only place that matters when it comes to climate change. In the next 10 years, if China doesn't get it right, the world won't get it right. It's the only battlefield that matters today in the short term. Let's see, let me, let me throw that same point to you. China may have a slightly more centralized way of, of being able to take those decisions and roll them out. How do other countries take innovative solutions that might be there and actually implement them so that the masses can benefit? I've had the privilege of meeting diverse individuals from diverse fields um, that could actually contribute to a lot that I'm doing in South Africa with um, entrepreneurs in underserved communities. Um, a lot of um, the, the emerging markets, you know, people from India, you know, that do fall within the, the BRICS um, economic block, um, have a lot of innovative solutions of how do we educate the young people? Because essentially that, that's where it has to start. As much as we can speak about the technologies that exist now and the current levels of unemployment that we are faced with, um, now I think progressive solutions, which is how we can integrate these innovations, is how now do we take it from when they're young? Um, so there are a lot of um, innovations that I've been engaging, um, especially from people from the Dominican Republic, um, India. They have great solutions about how do we educate young people about entrepreneurship. Um, one of the ways to uh, be innovative is perhaps to draw linkages, something that many of you have already touched on. So how can the different communities represented here, you've got scientists, you've got uh, social um, entrepreneurs, you know, how can, where can you make the linkages in order to come up with some of these um, solutions? Because um, Yobi set out a challenge. He thinks that uh, the forum, you guys, actually have to come up with uh, the answers. So Yobi. What kind of connections would you like to see here? I'd like to, to make this a more permanent. I mean, Top Link, by the way, thank you to the Top Link team. Uh, it's a really good community, but I think it, this community has to live beyond three days. And it has to live beyond 
you know, next January. And it's really up to all of us to engage. I already have some ideas for you. <laughs> you <know. laughs> Stefan, you want to add something to that as well? Ivana? I was just going to say, I won't really want to thank the Young Global Leaders staff for continuing to evolve the way that we learn to collaborate. And uh, it's a, they really help us bond and use all sorts of post-it notes and drawing mechanisms and uh, ways to communicate that are completely unique in any of the forums that I've participated in around the world. And so a lot of the collaborative leadership uh, programs that I run are d directly benefited by the Young Global Leaders. And this isn't a commercial, but if, if there's a way that everybody in this room could experience the Young Global Leader Annual Summit, I, I think that would be transformative. Nancy? Great. Oh, sorry, Ivana wanted Good to fun. come in then, Nancy. I think there are a few things. I mean, definitely the forum and the different groups that are set by the forum are extremely powerful to have people coming with different capabilities together to work on the same problems. Uh, I think also the personal relationships, uh, because once we know each other, once we spend time together, uh, the ability to just pick up the phone, send an email, hey, what do you think, and working on a very practical problem is also a very important dimension of solving those problems. Matty, final word to you. Great, yes. Um, well, I'm just a microcosm of what exists. Um, I belong to the, the, to the Global Shapers, and most of them are in the social development space. So they run a lot of nonprofits. And one thing that I was having a conversation um, early on with Mark is that you need to deem yourself as a socioeconomic imperative of your country or of your economy. And we have to see ourselves as social enterprises. So when we present ourselves, when we present what it is that we're doing, people have to see beyond charity, but beyond being a contribution towards our, our respective economies. Ivana, let me get a final comment from you. All right. It's a final, final. Thanks. And then there'll be a final, final, final from Yeah, you. that's yeah. right. And then a final. <laughs> okay, the first final. So I would just like to, to say that uh, I would uh, love to connect more with the members of other groups. I mean, uh, I'm really impressed what the shapers are doing, the global leaders, the social entrepreneurs, definitely what you <laughs> are doing. And uh, I, I just don't, didn't see so far so much of the interaction between the groups. I, I'm, Unfortunately, but I didn't. So I would really like to urge everyone to, to really interact. So, for example, with me, just like uh, let's meet and uh, let's talk and let's uh, work together. All right. So that may be something that we should all think about doing immediately after the session. Everyone stay and meet and chat with each other. It's a I great idea. I think the groups have, cannot sit with each other any longer. I think <laughs> for the rest of the forum, you're going to have to sit with a new person at every session. Right. Wow. Your final, final thoughts. That's a, that's a great weight. And I, I would just say simply that innovation in medicine, innovation in technology, innovation in commerce has to be met with social innovation that leads to sustainable societies. All right, I think we're almost done out here. Could I, could I please request Professor Schaub to come and join us and perhaps just say a few words? Okay. I can just come down here. Such a great group. I just want to leave you with one message. We are all the new champions. But for me, new champions does not mean just a community or means an individual. It means a new spirit. Our world needs a new spirit a much more collaborative spirit, a much more society-oriented spirit. And I think if we come out of this meeting, what we should bring into the world is this new spirit.